Um, this afternoon session will be the same as the previous lecture, will be divided in two parts. Uh, the first part will be delivered by myself, and it's going to be mainly on the framework for introduction of permanent shot grid lining in Slovenia, as implemented on the second track. Um, the second part will be presented by Mr. Uh, Zvonko Cotic, and he will uh, give you some in practical insight into implementation of permanent shot grid lining in Slovenia, as implemented on the second track and Perku Tunnel. Um, this first part of lecture will be delivered in English. The second part by Mr. Sotic will be delivered in Slovenian. However, uh, we will provide simultaneous uh, translation for our foreign guests. Uh, there will be someone during the break when we change the podium here. There will be some people walking around and who wants to have headphones. Um, you are very welcome to take one. Okay, so... I have an unpleasant duty to introduce myself. Um, so I'll be pretty brief. Following graduation at Faculty of Civil and Geodetic Engineering at the University of Ljubljana in 2004, uh, I continued to work at the faculty for the first eight years of my professional career as an assistant and researcher in the field of tunneling. I received my PhD in 2009, and in 2012, I joined Austrian-based Dr. Zarn Partners Company and I worked mainly in the North American mining and tunneling industry as a lead tunneling expert until mid-2020 when I joined the owner of 2TDK, of uh, the second track, 2TDK. Uh, within the next year, I worked on the preparation of several tenders, including the main construction works. Um, even before, I was working on the preparation of technical specifications, um, including the ones dealing with underground excavation and support, uh, which I will be more or less presenting today. Um, and in 2000, July of this year, I left 2DDK, and now I'm running my own independent consulting company, offering consulting um, services um, of many, let's say, engineering and tunneling uh, field in Slovenian as well as international mining and tunneling industry. That's very brief. Well, first thing I have to admit is, unlike the distinguished gentleman and lady uh, today, I'm not a concrete or shotcrete expert, I have to admit it. I'm a tunnel engineer. I have to deal with shotcrete because that's what we do. We do NATM, and that's also called the shotcrete method, right? So um, I know something about it, but not as much into depth as uh, the previous three lecturers, or Mr. Totic, who will join me here afterwards. So, um, what I will talk about today is implementation of global trends that were presented by uh, Alun, by, uh, by Wolfgang and Annika um, this morning. Why do I have echo? It shouldn't be. Okay, I'll try to keep off away from that one, but it's not... It's, it's turned off, so it shouldn't have any echo, but anyways. Um, so I will talk about how these global trends in shot grid technology are being transferred to Slovenia, implemented in our um, industry. So what I will talk about at the beginning is how we uh, designed and constructed tunnels in this region in the past, how we're doing it now, and at the end, we'll I'll briefly talk about how we're supposed to do it in future, following what our lecturers told us this morning. Um, in the meantime, I will say something about requirements of shotcrete on second track, about constituents, about mixed design equipment. Nothing different from what uh, you already heard today. I have a pretty tough task because I, there will be a lot of things that we'll have to repeat. Why? Because you will see on some of my slides, I more or less was following the work of uh, our distinguished lecturers. So I will talk about quality assurance on second track, about the mixed design approval process, about the nozzleman acceptance test, and equipment approval, which is nothing different than the, those three M's that uh, uh, Wolfgang was telling us about, right? Mixed design, man, and machinery. And I will talk about a bit on quality control on second track, about production testing, and about as-built testing. 
since there's a pretty um, considerable content, I suggest we start pretty fast. Well, that's what I said. You've seen this already today, right? So what we were doing in the past, we were doing the classical double shell lining. So sprayed um, bar and mesh reinforced shot grid as a primary lining, waterproofing membrane, sheet waterproofing membrane in between, and then secondary lining made of plain or bar reinforced casting plate concrete. Loads applied separately, I won't go through this, so there was none of the loads put in the long term on the primary lining, it was just, everything was on the secondary lining. That's how it looked. What we were using, we weren't even using the lattice girders. We were using the heavy TH arches, which we know it's pretty soft to spray behind, to don't have any voids. And in terms of how we sprayed, there was lots of voids in our primary lining. Can such primary lining be considered as a permanent structure? Well, I don't think so, right? There has to be shot crit, but we had lots of voids, lots of nests of rebound and so on. But about 18 years ago, they were constructing the motorway tunnel, the Kani, which is uh, just above the T8 tunnel, which will pass soon underneath. And that they were using the steel fiber reinforced shot grid for primary support. Um, they constructed the trial field and 410 meter long section of a tunnel. Because of the much faster advance rate, they were able to finish the tunnel four years, uh, four months ahead. Sorry for that. Um, so instead of five meters per day, they were excavating and supporting seven meters. So even back then, they figure out, okay, we can be much faster just using the steel fiber reinforced shot grid instead of uh, wire mesh reinforced. That's how we did the inner lining. In section, it was just plain shot grid, no reinforcement. It was only the uh, Shenfit tunnel, which was uh, where the inner lining was reinforced for various reasons, like sulfate corrosion of shot grid. And that was the only one. What we're doing now, it's, uh, these are photos from um, Peko Tunnel and more details about this Peko Tunnel and how we construct there will be provided by Zvonko in the next presentation. So what we were doing at the beginning, we were using lattice girder, so no more TH arches. Uh, what we're using now, we don't use any wire mesh anymore, we don't use lattice girders anymore, it's just um, synthetic fiber uh, reinforced shot crit. So we did a step forward. Um, and this is being used in a systematic support. So it's not just a short section. It's going to be a large portion of the tunnel constructed as a permanent sprayed concrete lining. I have to excuse myself. Uh, I will use more or less term shot crit. I told you I was working in North American uh, mining industry and tunneling industry. So to me, Shot crit is the term, I hardly get used to the sprayed concrete, but you will understand. And when I said fiber crit, that means fiber reinforced shot crit, or fiber reinforced sprayed concrete. How will we do the inner lining? Well, exactly the same as we did 15, 20 years ago. So in areas, just a plain shot crit shell, and in some areas, um, reinforced, especially where we have to do, um, where we have like high uh, hydrostatic pressures, in, for example, in tunnels T1 and T2. But we, in kind of, we did move from this double shell lining into combined lining approach. So having fiber reinforced shot crit as a primary lining, still uh, sheet waterproofing membrane, and then the cast in place concrete. Can we get away from this pretty soon? I don't think so. We'll try to see whether we can implement, let's say, proper uh, composite lining in some of our tunnels, but that comes at the end. That's what I said, uh, design and construction of tunnels in Slovenia in the future. Again, nothing that you haven't seen so far. What we do at the moment, we apply 35% of ground load on the primary lining for long-term um, load, and 65 is applied to the secondary lining, which is 
kind of opposite of what these two gentlemen were telling us today, right? But we are not in that stage in yet. Why? Because we have that gap of 10 years when we didn't do any major tunnel construction. Um, we have to develop ourselves on the designer side, on the contractor side, and also on the owner side. That's why we are um, organizing today this event. Uh, what does it take to make short grid lining permanent? Again, we already heard that. I'll just quickly uh, go through it, and at the end of this presentation, we'll check whether we did something on it already on the second track. So it's improved quality of short grid with low water to cement ratios and use of microsilica, alkali-free set accelerators, wet mix short grid applied with automated and mechanized equipment, robots, highly skilled wet mix robot operators, stringent quality control of wet mix process, structural fiber reinforcement, appropriate design approach and development of advanced numerical tools for analysis of solid structure interaction, and development of scanning technology for profile control allowed removal of lattice girders. I will walk you through um, these requirements uh, and how we coped with them uh, on the second track. Um, again, 3M, just very briefly. Um, it's about the quality of shot grid depends on the shot grid mix. It depends on the state-of-the-art equipment and, of course, skilled nozzlemen. We prove everything by thorough testing. We have to apply testing as... Uh, Volgan said we have to apply it wi wisely and we'll see how we are dealing with this on the second track. So this move from double shell lining to combined lining plus requirement for a hundred year design life led to something different that we were used to before, right? We always hear from especially like uh, older engineers, why we are changing, we did so many tunnels and they are still operational and there's nothing wrong with them. Um, true. But if we want to follow these trends presented today, uh, we had to develop a new generation of technical specifications which caused a bit of chaos among contractors, among supervision, among external quality control. Why? Because we are changing stuff. We're implementing new testing um, procedures. We are implementing new qualification controls, acceptance testing, and so on, which is new to this environment here, right? Something which is pretty common in, let's say, UK and North America, but here it was, it's just something new. And it causes problems, of course. Let's go briefly through what the requirements for the shot grid components are. Cement, what we allow is SEM1, SEM2A, um, all different types, and SEM1, SR0 for these uh, places where we have the sulfate aggression or where we have uh, sulfate uh, aggression possible due to the groundwater. Aggregate, uh, we have limited amount of fines. Uh, it's 3% if input stone contains traces of sediments and 5% if not. The reason why is because we will be tunneling through limestone and we will have our excavated material crushed and it's going to contain in traces uh, clays from karst features um, in within the um, joints and so on. Uh, cement tissue sedatives, of course, are allowed. Um, it's blast furnace lac, it's fly ash, it's silica fume, which is required for FRS. The reason why is exactly um, what was written on one slide before. And this originates from my, let's say, not understanding of Slovenian market. Because when I was working in North America, silica fume is industrial waste. It's very cheap. You can get it everywhere. And in Slovenia, we don't have any. In the range of several hundred kilometers around, you cannot really get silica film. So that's where I made a mistake. And I said, I'm not, I'm not a concrete slash shot with specialist, and I don't really understand the specifics of our local market. I have to apologize for that. But I still believe that on a long run, we'll probably will have to use it to make our um, shot grid lining 
uh, permanent. The durability is improved, uh, especially when we use the fiber reinforcement, right? Um, we provided just the upper limits. So um, we didn't say how much you have to put in. We just provided the upper limits uh, in technical specifications. When it comes to the chemical admixtures, only alkalized free set accelerators may be used uh, with maximum dosage of 8%. If more, it is not considered the structural. Why? I was working on some projects where we were, for, we were doing testing of compressive strength on a longer run, and we, were, we saw when we used 9, 10%, it was decreasing on a long run. Slowly, but it was decreasing. I don't know whether it was just um, the samples themselves, or it was actually uh, the shotgun that was losing strength. Um, only high range water reducing agents or hyperplasticizers may be used. Hydration control, very much appreciated. Up to eight hours, untreated only up to 90 minutes. Effect of each of these chemical admixtures used must be proven inside trials. You cannot just put something in and say, oh, it works. No, we want to see how it works. So you have to uh, compare the contractor or the shot technologists have to compare the treated and untreated uh, shot to see what the effect of admixtures is. In water protection area, uh, non-soluble admixtures are required. They should be, if it, they're water soluble, they should be um, swapped around with non-soluble ad admixtures. And that's mainly the tunnels T1 and T2 within the karst area. Uh, fibers, they might be either steel or synthetic. We provided the aspect ratio. We limited the length uh, for both of them, and we provided minimum tensile strength and E-modulus for synthetic fibers. There's nothing on dosage in those technical specifications. It's just performance-based criteria, um, which is good. I, me as a designer, I don't care how much fibers you put in, as long as you achieve uh, the required flexural strength. Um, on the mix design, water to cement ratio should be lower than 0.45. This is to reach the 100 year design lifetime. Uh, minimum total cement content should be about 300, should be 350 kg per cubic meter or more. Uh, in terms of early strength development, the J2 class, according to uh, EN 1448, is required for the first 24 hours. Um, where we have low overburden underneath populated area, we have to achieve 12 MPA in 24 hours. If workers want to get underneath the freshly sprayed concrete or into the work exclusion zone, the shot should have 0.5 MPA. So if the contractor wants to have quick advance, they should make sure that their shot um, has uh, the has um, appropriate uh, early strength. Uh, at the time of blast initiation, 1.5 MPA is required. So that's another pretty tough um, requirement if you want to have fast advance. Uh, and of course, C25 to 30, 30 MPA after 28 days. Uh, which, there is another requirement which is put here in red, and that's the 56 day compressive strength has to be 5% above the 28 day strength. That's something we know from Crossrail where that um, requirement was put in place. This is mainly to prevent that all the um, strength development was already used up in the early, in the early stage. Um, and what then the last requirement I put it out is the flexural toughness for fibercrete should be 320 joules after seven days and 400 joules after 28 days for the RDP test, according to ASTM 1550. And we'll see later what that is. Um, since we have this 10-year gap in tunnel construction in Slovenia I was telling you about, and also Shotcrete has not been widely used in other sectors of uh, engineering construction, um, furthermore, new local companies uh, without previous knowledge and experience in shotcrete are now um, rising in the market. The old ones, we know they went bankrupt. So uh, as I said in the opening speech this morning, 
um, a lot of knowledge, a lot of experience, a lot of skill was lost. So we are starting more or less from scratch. And due to continuous improvement in shot free technology, which was presented today, we knew that we might have potential problems with quality and durability of shot crit. That's why we designed a pretty complex um, approval process for the mix design. And let me walk you through this three-stage procedure. First one, this is nothing which is new in, for example, in UK. That's how things go in UK. I was working there, that's why I know. I just took the system, because I saw it's working, and planned it here, and it's mandatory. So first thing what you do is the lab testing and you do the compatibility tests. It's determine whether you, the selected cements, the one you're gonna use, um, will actually work with the um, accelerator. So you do different tests just to make sure that this works. And that's a basic test for shot crit. The second step are the side trials, where we prove capability of spraying equipment and effectiveness of selected chemical admixtures. We establish proper volume and pressure of air that's through side trials, the contractor will finalize the mix design. It's a pretty neat tool. And the third stage is what we already knew, that's the pre-construction acceptance testing, where we prove the performance of approved equipment, nozzle and materials under actual field conditions. So we prove compliance to the um, technical specifications. However, this first two steps could be omitted if the contractor provided um, testing records from previous projects where they would show that they were constantly achieving or exceeding uh, the requirements set here at the second track. So uh, a skilled contractor could go directly to here. This could be um, actually omitted. Um, very briefly on the Compatibility test that tests accelerated uh, initial and final set of cement. Here are the um, requirements from technical specification. Uh, water reducing agents and hydration control agents may be checked for but need to be verified during site trials. So you can do it, but it's not urgent because you will have to prove the effectiveness of this chemical admixtures during the site trials. And the site trials that's the main part, right? That's where you actually finalize, develop and finalize your uh, shot read mix. Um, and during the site trials, you should de determine design range or slump or spread diameter, early and long-term compressive strength development uses in actual spraying equipment, so the one you will be using during the works, not just bring one equipment and then spray with other. Um, Optimum water to cement and water to binder ratios, compatibility of water reducing agents and hydration control agents with cement and accelerator use. Optimum dosage of water reducing and hydration control agents to achieve plant properties of fresh shot crit, like workability and pot life. That's what Wolfgang was saying this morning. Then the optimum dosage of accelerator to achieve plant early strength development of place shot crit and effect of accelerator and the long term strength development of proposed shot crit mixes. Effectiveness of other chemical admixtures by the comparison to untreated shot crit, that's what I said. So anything that you will be adding into the shot crit on the chemical side, you have to prove effectiveness by comparing treated and untreated shot crit. And flexural toughness and fiber count for fiber crit. Why a lot of this uh, is actually in here, that's probably a question I would be asked by either Wolfgang or... Um, Alun, and I will answer right away. When we were writing these specifications, we knew that we might have Chinese contractors. We knew we might have Turkish contractors, and they would bring some chemicals from different, let's say, manufacturers, right? And we don't know how all of them work, so they have to prove them on site under field conditions. That's why this is here. Oops, sorry. That's why this is here. Even though it may sound a bit weird, but considering the situation where we were, it's pretty obvious why we put them in. Um, side trials, however, can be performed in some extenuating conditions because results are indicative. 
So uh, smaller panels are allowed, less panels can be sprayed for uh, flexural toughness tests, for compressive strength tests, just to reduce the cost, because you have to do several of them to find out whether your mixes work or not. What is required is the presence of the engineer and external quality control throughout the uh, site trials, just to make sure that everything runs smoothly and the way it should. What is required before we can continue to, this, to the third stage? It's a 20-day results for compressive strength and flexural toughness. Let's move to the third step in the three-stage process, and that's the pre-construction acceptance testing. Again, under field conditions. What you have to do, you have to do the fresh, fresh mix consistency check, early and long term compressive strength development of applied shotcrete, and flexural toughness of fibercrete, including the fiber count. Again, under, uh, con under supervision of the engineer and external quality control, and here the 56 day results are required for the compressive strength and 28 day results for flexural toughness. Um, that's how we did it. So this is for the compressive strength and this is for the uh, flexural toughness. There was a lot of panels to be sprayed uh, in one single day and Zvonko will tell you a bit more about what the problems were and what the suggestions would be for the future. As I was saying, 28 days strength required, 56 days strength required, this leads to a pretty lengthy process. If uh, we do all three stages. Altogether, we need about 112 days. If first two, so the lab testing and the field tests or the side trials could be omitted, then it takes about 70 days. And that should be taken into account when we design the process. Like, we cannot say, oh, yes, we'll sign a contract in seven days. Um, it's a commencement date. It doesn't go that easy, right? Because you have to take into account that if you want to have control on what kind of shot quit will be applied in your tunnels, you need time. That's just to um, give heads up to the owners, because owners are usually the ones that are pushing. Okay, we ha you have to start constructing immediately, right? I was working in the second track, and I know how this went. And I'm really um, sad that not more of the representative on the owner side joined us today here to see that some things take time. Um, the second M is equipment. What is required? Only wet process allowed for the structural thickness of shot grit, and only mechanized spraying is allowed, no hand spraying at all. Um, that's what uh, Wolfgang pointed out, is no pulsation of shot grit flow. It should be interrupted, right? All machinery will not be accepted. Why? Because you cannot provide good uh, embedment of uh, reinforcement or decent shot crit. Um, accelerator may be only dosed using computer. String maintenance of spraying equipment is required to ensure continuous quality. And regular calibration tests of accelerator flow required, because what we know that the accelerator tends to crystallize. And if you don't clean those injection holes regularly, Suddenly they will say, oh, shot crit doesn't work. There's something wrong with it. No, it's not. Usually it's just the injection holes being plugged. Um, and we get to the last M. It's man, workmanship, or the nozzleman skills. As Alun already mentioned, and I think also uh, you, Wolfgang, there are some certification schemes in Europe which are available for the nozzleman, and it's the FNARC C2 and Nozzleman certificate. However, we don't have local examiners. It's a new program which is being put in place right now. And not many uh, Nozzleman hold a uh, valid certificate at the moment in Slovenia. Another thing which is, it's uh, this certification scheme was under development during uh, the production of these technical specifications. And even though this scheme is pretty um, detailed and very hands-on, we decided not to use it. Um, main question was, would be contractors able to provide this training and certificates 
in time needed for commencement of the construction. At that time, I was discussing with Alun, if you remember, um, and uh, we figured out that it would be pretty tough. So we decided to implement a project certification scheme, and I will show briefly how it looks like. So we have two different procedures, and they differ uh, according to uh, what kind of shotcrit we're spraying. So the first one is when we spray plain shotcrit into um, wire mesh and lattice girder reinforced shotcrit, or when we spray just the uh, regular fibercrit. Um, regular fiber crit we just play into the uh, panel, it's pretty straightforward. The more complex one is this part where they have to spray through the wire mesh and lattice girder. The depth of the panel is 7 to 10 centimeters, which corresponds to the space we usually have behind the lattice girder and the wire mesh, right? Because of some over-excavation, which was pointed out earlier by Wolfgang. Um, in the specs, it says that the mock-up has to be done with the most congested reinforcement, which is, in our case, what's shown here. Uh, each nozzleman has to spray two panels. It's one on top and one uh, horizontally, so on the wall. Um, and there is a three-stage assessment process. In the first one, the external quality control assesses the distance and the angle to the receiving surface. If that's all, good. And of course, when it's finished, the, uh, when the spraying is done, what kind of finish? The finish should be smooth, uh, shouldn't have too many uneven surfaces, right? And if that's okay, they will remove uh, the back of the panel and they will check the back. If the back is solid and there's no signs of voids or just a limited amount, for example, here, of rebound in the corners because it has a 90 degree angle. Um, they will go for the third stage and the third stage is actually coring through the most congested part. At least three of the cores have to be drilled through the lattice girder because we know the toughest part to spray is not wire mesh itself, it's lattice girder because there's lots of bars which need to be embedded in shot grid, right? Um, the matter, diameter, of course, should be minimum of 100 millimeters. And the uh, uh, assessment goes by the, uh, the specification of um, this American standard, which has five grades. We modified it a bit because we know it's pretty tough to achieve what is actually written there because it says in very small millimeters what is allowed. Um, loud void or a loud uh, nest. So what's shown here, these are grade one and grade two. So if we don't have any visible laminations, if shot crit is well compacted, if there's no voids, major voids, there's some smaller ones, but no major voids. If um, there are man minimum, like here, there's a bit of lamination, but it's not a big one. So that would be considered as grade one or two. Um, if we have like one bigger lamination, if we have uncompacted uh, shot crit underneath the lattice girder bars, if we have some, for example, here like some nests of rebound, that would be graded as grade three. And grade four goes towards worse, so we have bigger holes, there's no shot crit underneath, and grade five is where we actually have big holes inside the shot grid sprayed. If the nozzleman, no, nozzleman would qualify, would get a, a project certificate, if, in two cases, wouldn't get qualified, sorry. If two or more samples are given grade three per panel, so if we had some major flaws, or any of samples in the panel is given grade four or five. If that happens, the nozzleman should receive training and a proper training like uh, our lecturers described this morning and try again after minimum of 14 days. If they fail again, they're not allowed to spray on the project. That's how it is. It's pretty tough, but that's the only possible way to achieve good workmanship. Um, now we go to the, from quality assurance, we now go to quality uh, control. And we'll talk about testing. So we have two different types of testing. 
And first one is where we, we I call it the production testing, where we spray shot grit into the panels, either for flexural strength testing or for the compressive strength testing. And then is the other one, it's S-build testing where we core samples directly from in situ lining. So we see how it's actually, because we know when they have to spray panels, they usually do a very good job, right? Uh, when they spray into the actual lining, they're always in a hurry, right? Because there's a push for meters. And we know that all, usually there will be way worse quality in the in situ lining than in the panels. Um, consistency check, I will go very briefly through this uh, basic testing procedures because the rest will be provided by Zvonko, also some results. Um, contractor is free to select what kind of method they will use, either slump flow diameter or flow slump diameter. Um, all three are allowed. Um, early strength testing, very simple, using the uh, penetrometer and Hilti test, nothing special on that. Long-term compressive strength development above 10 MPA, also according to the standard. The only thing that differs from standard is we don't submerge the samples into the water. They have to stay at the ambient temperature and humidity representative of tunnel environment. That's must. So we get the proper, uh, let's say, approximate idea what is the actual strength and not the ideal strength, which we know that uh, shot crit in tunnels is never exposed to, right? Um, and then we get to the test that we never, we haven't done many in, uh, or none, I will say none, except for uh, Mr. Shustashic who did some tests on the, for the Dekani tunnel I showed you before. We go to flexural test, uh, for the flexural toughness testing on the panels. And there's a question, this or this? So we go for the ASTM 1550 uh, uh, round determinant panel or so-called pizza test, or we go for the old FNAR test or test according to 1448.5. Uh, I had the discussions with different uh, experts around the world, among them also with uh, Alun, and um, based on thorough thinking, and I can say that went on for, the, for months, we decided for pizza tests, and I will show you why. Pizza tests, um, it's 80 centimeter diameter, uh, 75 millimeter thick um, panel, where we support it in three points, and here is the actual uh, photo of how it's supported, and this will always, more or less always, not 100%, it will result in three cracks roughly at 120 degree angle. On the other hand, if we have the FNARC, I will just call it the FNARC test, which because your code, I mean the EN standard just took up the FNARC um, guideline. We have the panel supported on the edge all around. And that's how it looks like in reality. And then we get cracks. And two different samples may crack in different patterns. I just took two on top of them, and then you can see that we have different length and number of cracks. Are we testing a material, or we just have very test-dependent test? Because test? if we compare here, for example, we have a predefined cracking pattern, always same length and always same number of cracks. So we test, in my opinion, we test material itself. Here, it's pretty much the test dependent because it depends, the absorbed energy will depend on how many cracks, on the length of the cracks you have, right? And that was the main thing why we decided to go with the American standards. There was a big pushback, even during the development of this uh, technical specification, because they were saying, oh, we have a, a European standard. Why the hell we wanna get American standard? And I was like, 
we can use either of them if one is better, right? And this is the main reason why we decided for it. Again, I consulted with several uh, people who know this topic and Alun himself being from European Union at that time, he said, yes, I would go also for the uh, round determinant panel, uh, the pizza test, ASTM 1550. I will show you a bit of, um, let's say, analysis of testing results I collected on one of the projects in North America where we extensively used uh, fibercrete. It was not just extensively, it was exclusively big uh, underground caverns. And we had some problems at the beginning with mix design and with testing, and we had to do a pretty extensive analysis. What we did, we analyzed a large number of curves, and here we marked them it's f with five uh, letters, A, B, C, D, and E, A being a proper curve, and the rest of them, something wrong with them. We just saw that some patterns are actually being repeated all the time, and I'll show you just briefly what it is. So that's a normal behavior, what we expect, of course. We apply load, it breaks, then the load decreases, and then the residual uh, strength gets into the game, right? And that's a normal uh, curve. This one where we see some other humps or just increasing up and down, two humps, maybe even three, there's something wrong with them. We call them erroneous. We gave them more erroneous. Here, we can see it's more or less linear. Again, another hump which, where we saw when we analyzed in detail the testing procedure, we saw that actually it slipped. You know, when the loading um, device got on, onto, the, onto the panel, it slipped when we applied load. And that's why now when we talk with people here on the internal quality control, we tell them, oh, you have to be very careful to make really nice smooth surface where the um, load will be applied, just to avoid things like this. Um, so what is a good thing about the RDP test or the pizza test is that we get often and I said, well, often, once we figure out what's wrong with our mix design and once we start performing uh, flexural toughness tests correctly, we saw that the curves more or less coincide on three samples, all of, all of them, all the time. I'm sorry, I'm using too much time. I'll try to speed up because I still have some to go. Um, so we developed, we went through all the samples and tried to see what kind of deformation patterns we see. And these were more or less correct ones because they have these three uh, distinct cracks. And here we can see we have either more or just two of them. So, and here we can see if it has a mark A, that means that there are three cracks at approximately 20, 120 degrees, we can see we get the highest line. And of course, we get the highest corrected energy. And then if it's more or less like one at 180 degrees and one um, at 90 degree, we can see we get lower ones. Why? Because less uh, capacity was um, actually uh, mobilized. And that's what it is. So where we have proper curves and three cracks, we get the highest results. Whenever we have something wrong with the curves, either with the testing, that's where we get the lower results. And that's where we think that we should um, abandon those samples. Why? Because not, we were testing the test, not the material itself. Um, another reason why we went for the panels is they're more realistic than the FNARC test. For example, if we take these three bolts, that's exactly where we have. We have it supported here, we have it supported here, and then we have a wedge pushing in the center, right? It's a realistic test. Do you see anywhere where we have continuous support around the whole panel. No, we don't. And that was another reason. Um, when we compared lots of curves, we noticed one thing. So from increase of flexural toughness from seven days to 28 days, it's just sometimes it increases, but mainly it stays the same. So if 
we know that we have consistent quality, we might do just the seven day test and 28 day, day test may be omitted. If we have a consistent quality, remember what we're going to saying. So trying to omit the excessive testing. Um, when splitting test on the in-situ court samples, again, this is the courtesy of uh, Jakob Schustersic. Um, that's what we will use on the, not like it's uh, presented here, but we'll use circular samples. We'll court 15 centimeter diameter uh, samples from in situ primary lining and we will do the, um, the wet split test on it. Load will be always applied in spraying direction. That was one of the questions we had when we had a meeting with uh, Jakob and his colleagues. What kind of standard is this test performed to? Is it EN? Is it ASTM? No. It's just a scientific paper and a very thorough description in the um, technical specifications. That's what we'll go after. And there is another thing. It's a fiber count, uh, which is according to 1448-7 uh, test. It's counting fibers in the hardened shot grid. So we would count the fibers that actually pass through the crack. Um, it doesn't say any info of how many fibers were actually in the initial mix um, or how many fibers are in the plight. It's just how many cracks, how many fibers pass through the crack. So we developed a new test, which is just defined in the technical specification document three. You take two samples, one from the hopper and the second sample, about 1.2 to 2 kilos, taken from the spray patch on the wall. What we do then, we determine volume by weighing each sample in water, water scale, which is presented here. So just a measuring scale at the outside, filled with water, put a, the material in and you get what is the volume weight of this sample. You wash out fibers from both samples, clean and dry them out, weigh the mass. Uh, and you calculate the fiber content and the fiber rebound ratio. And it can tell you why maybe your uh, flexural strength is too low. Um, and we get almost to the end. The frequency, testing, frequency of testing, compressive strength has to be tested each 100 cubic meters of applied shot crit. And that's per theoretical volume as per support type and also the flexural toughness. But both frequencies are detached. That doesn't mean if you are achieving or exceeding compressive strength and you're doing bad on the flexural strength, you can go to 250 meters, cubic meters on the uh, compressive strength and still keep 100 meter, uh, so, so each, hundred, each 100 cubic meter frequency on the flexural strength. What is that? That is a stick and carrot motivation for the uh, contractor. If they're doing good, if they made a good mix design, they can reduce their cost for the internal quality control, which is a good thing, of course. If we go in further, remember I said, there's not much increase in general in flexural toughness from seven to 28 days. If seven day tests exceeded 30, 360 joules, which is 90% of the 28 day flexural toughness, and at least three consecutive previous 28 day results exceeded 400 joules, which is the requirement here on the second track, um, 28 day tests may be omitted. We know that these uh, pizza tests are pretty tough to perform. Why? Because these panels are pretty heavy. 80 centimeter diameter, uh, it can weigh up to 80 kilos, even, even more with the panel itself. So if the contractor can reduce this, well, it's good to go. Um, and when we are introducing new, let's say new type of uh, support, and we know that our measurement, the payment on the second track, and not just only the second track, but also other tunnels, which are being constructed according to NATAM, we use the Enorm B2203. And for, we apply same rating factor for the plane shot grid as well to the fiber grid. Same amount of time is needed to apply one or another. And we compensate contractor for installation of guiding elements. These are either the depth pins or guide wires. And we consider them as lattice girder. So they get time by using the rating factor on the time side, but they don't get it on the material side. So the material itself, it's included in the price of shot crit. Okay, two slides to go. So I won't be too, too late. 
Um, we already saw this slide, right? Let's see what we did so far. Did we are using the low water to cement ratio, check. We're not using microsilica, so not, not really a check. We are using alkali-free acid accelerators. We are only applying wet mix uh, with automated and mechanized equipment. We are trying pretty hard to um, train our equipment operators. Uh, we have stringent quality control of wet mix process. We are using the structural fiber reinforcement. Uh, the design was done correctly using advanced numerical tools uh, uh, for analysis of salt structure interaction. We are not actually using the scanning technology at the moment. We're using the depth pins. More will be presented by, the, by Zvonko in the next presentation. And we removed lattice girders. And that's going to be shown in the presentation of Zvonko as well. So my question now is, how will we build tunnels in the future? Can we make a step forward from where we are at the moment, from combined lining, into, uh, so, no, this is not combined lining. This is, oh, sorry. So from combined lining to composite lining, sorry, I'm already tired a bit. So can we make that step forward? Probably not right from scratch. Maybe as uh, Wolfgang suggested, we could use some portion of tunnels which are in a relatively dry environment where we could apply it. For example, emergency exit tube on the uh, Poco tunnel. It's about 150 meters of a small diameter tunnel where we could probably potentially try it out. Maybe it's just an idea where we could go to. So I'd like to thank you for your attention. I apologize for being a bit too late, but I'd like to talk. You already saw that.